So, you guys ready to dive into the Word of Life today? I'm excited. We are starting a new series today, and the title of this series is Called. We want to help you to discover God's call on your life. Every single person has a call from God. But a lot of people see this idea of calling as something mystical, something that you receive on the top of a mountain or during a spiritual awakening. Some people think that a calling is something that only special people have, but that's not the case. Calling is for everyone. But the thing is, is that most people just aren't aware that they are called. Well, that changes today. Amen? Amen. So I want to start out by asking a question. What was your first job? What was the first thing that you regularly got paid to do besides doing chores around the house? What was your first job? Babysitting? Okay. So my first job I had when I was four years old. Now, you may laugh at this, but I worked really hard. I worked for a canoe rental in southern Missouri, and this, was the, this is the 80s, so there were no child labor laws, right? And so what I did was for three hours every Saturday in the summer, there would be three shifts of canoes. They would bring, and they would set them down by the river. And my job as a four-year-old up until I was nine was to put paddles, cushions, life jackets, and trash bags in every single canoe that got dropped off, and they would usually be 50 at a time. Now, that job worked out great for me because after the people left, I got to play in the river, and my payment every week was always enough to buy a new Ninja Turtle. So I was very, very happy with that. Now, I'm going to use a word right now, and guys, I know we're in church, but it's a four-letter word, and it's going to bring absolute disgust into the heart for some of you, okay? So bear with me. Work. Yeah. Work. All right? I know. I know. Forgive me. So what is the worst job that you ever had? What is the worst job that you ever had? And I want you to think about this. What made it such a negative experience? Was it the task itself? Was it the environment or the conditions that you were working in? Was it maybe your coworkers? Maybe it was the people or the person in authority over you. All of the above. All, of the above. All right. Now I want to ask you this question. Because so many times we associate work with a job. But the Bible wants us to associate work with calling. With calling. In the, book of, in the book of Genesis, the Bible gives us a very clear picture of what paradise looks like. What is the place that we are waiting for everything to get restored back to? What is that place? The Garden of Eden, right? Everything in the Bible points back toward the Garden of Eden, points forward toward the restoration of all things, the new heaven and the new earth, for us to be able to experience paradise again. But if you read what the Bible says about paradise in Genesis chapter 1, and specifically in Genesis chapter 2, God reveals his perfect plan for mankind. And within this plan, there was no sin. And this plan brought complete, total fulfillment. And a big part of that fulfillment came from work. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, it says, The Lord took the man and he put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. Work is God's plan for us. It's part of God's calling on our lives as people. Now, when God said that he wanted them to work it and to keep it, what he was referring to was cultivation, creativity, preservation, maintenance. Work is part 
of paradise. If you refuse to work, if you have a negative attitude about work, you're never going to be able to experience any type of paradise in this life because you're going to be disconnected with God's purpose, with God's calling on your life. And Genesis chapter 2, verse 19, it gives us a little bit of a clearer picture of what Adam was tasked to do. It says, Now out of the ground the Lord God made every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens, and he brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. You see, the first thing that God did for Adam is he assigned him a task. He assigned him work to do because calling and work are synonymous. He didn't give him a job. He gave him work. Because as the steward of the earth, Adam was responsible for for naming and knowing the names of all the animals because that allowed him to characterize, that allowed him to care for them moving forward. But something happened. In Genesis chapter 3, a snake comes into the garden. We know that snake was named Satan. He convinced Adam and Eve to rebel against God and their rebellion, their sin in the garden did something to work. In Genesis chapter 3, starting at verse 17, it says, And God said to Adam, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, now guys, usually a good thing, okay? Don't use this verse of Scripture to just tune them out all the time. But if they hand you an apple, you go the other direction. Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and you have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread until you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust and to dust you will return. What does this say? Sin causes the earth to rebel against us in the same way that we rebelled against God. So now work is no longer a simple, completely enjoyable task. Now, now work can and will involve a level of discomfort or even pain. And that pain might be physical, emotional, mental. There is strain in any kind of work that we do. And because of how sin operates, work is now often contrary. It works against our efforts. Our projects fight us. Everything has entropy. Things naturally fall apart. Things do not stay orderly or organized. And you often have to deal with other people in their brokenness. To get things done. Work is messy. So Genesis chapter 3 gives us a very clear picture of why work is hard. But there is still a need for work to be fulfilled as human beings. Just because it is difficult does not give us license to avoid it. Amen? In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 12 and 13, King Solomon says, I perceived that there is nothing better for them, talking about humanity, than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also, that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all of his toil, all of his work. This is God's gift to man. Now, if you've ever read through the book of Ecclesiastes, it's one of my favorites. Because the language used in Ecclesiastes is pretty much ironic sarcasm. Solomon, who 
pretty much had every type of pleasurable experience known to man at the time of writing this, he was, um, he was writing from the perspective of someone who had been there and done that. He had all the t-shirts. But in a few moments of sober clarity, he also makes this statement about life. That God's gift to man is to take pleasure in our toil. To find meaning and value and fulfillment in the task that God has assigned us. Now, some of us have a really difficult time imagining work as a gift because that gift does not fit our expectations and rarely does it fit our immediate desires. I want to share with you a story about a gift. Now, to be honest with you, I've, been, I've heard this story for many years in lots of churches. I don't know if it's a true story or not, but we're going to say that it is. There was a father who loved his son. Very wealthy man, could afford to give his, his son the best of everything, and his son was used to the best of everything. But this man also had a deep, passionate love for God, and he wanted to pass this on to his son. His son's 18th birthday approached, and the father decided to give his son the best gift that he could think of. Now, his son had all of these imaginations of what he was going to get for his 18th birthday. In fact, he had imagined that his dad was going to give him a brand new, shiny sports car. Top of the line, the best money he could buy. So the day of his party comes around, and the last gift that he receives is from his father. And his son hungrily tears open the gift. And inside the box is a Bible. The son was so angry that he took the Bible, he looked his father in the eyes, he threw it in the trash, and he walked out of the house. That was the last time he ever spoke to his dad. About 40 years later, the father passes away. And he leaves everything he owns to his son. The lawyer calls, the son shows up, and the son walks into his father's house that he hasn't been in in 40 years, and he walks into his father's office. And there, sitting on his father's desk, in the center of the desk, is that Bible he threw away 40 years ago. So the son walks over, picks up the Bible, and he opens it up to the front page. And on that front page, it says, to my son whom I love, the greatest gift I could ever give to you is my gift, is my love for the father. But I hope you can enjoy this as well. And taped below the message was the key to a brand new sports car from 40 years ago. The son threw away years of joy and relationship because he refused to open the gift. Many of us refuse to open the gift of work. And we choose instead to discard it and, just, and to just go to a job that we hate. And it robs us of the joy that God intends for us. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 23, it says, Whatever you do, work heartily, as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. In all of your work, in everything you do, who are you serving? You're serving Jesus. You're not serving the company. You're not serving your coworkers. You're not serving your boss or your employees. You're not even serving yourself. The first person that you are working for is Jesus. And it says that we should take on this work heartily. Heartily means with excellence. 
Let me give you an equation. Excellence equals effort plus attitude. Your attitude matters in your work. For your work to be worship, for your work to be satisfying and fulfilling, your attitude toward that work absolutely matters. Let me tell you a couple of things that work is not. Work is not about providing for yourself. God is your provider. Work is not punishment, contrary to popular belief. In fact, it is part of God's plan for your ultimate joy. Work is not a waste of time. No, it is time spent toward genuine fulfillment. Work is not about accumulating stuff. But if you use it correctly, you will be blessed to be a blessing. Work is not about power, position, or prestige. But if you have the right attitude and work ethic, God will use your work to put you in positions of influence for His glory. Let's talk about what work is. Work is about serving, being like Jesus. Work allows us to learn responsibility. Work helps us to develop faithfulness. Work gives us opportunity to utilize our creativity to make things better. Work allows us to glorify God by using our gifts and our talents to the best of our ability on behalf of others and ourselves. This is God's expectation of our work. That we realize that it's not all about us, but it's an opportunity to serve Him and to use what He has given us to make things better. Are you actively making the place you work better? Because if you are, if you are putting your energy toward that, then you have discovered your calling. Guys, calling isn't about some far off thing. Calling isn't about pastoral or church ministry. Maybe you have that calling, but you are serving in ministry just as much out there serving the Lord as you are in here. Calling is about using what God has given you to help the rest of the world see God in and through you. And that comes out most clearly through the way we conduct ourselves at work. Let me give you an example of this from Exodus chapter 31. The Lord said to Moses, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship, to devise artistic designs, to work in gold, silver, and bronze, in cutting stones for setting and in carving wood, to work in every craft. And behold, I have appointed with him Aholiab, the son of some guy of the tribe of Dan. And I have given to all able men ability. And they will make all that I have commanded to you. Let me ask you a question. Have you been born again by the power of Jesus? Do you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you? Then you have the same calling as Bezalel. To serve the Lord with your gifts and talents. Look at this list of things that God says that he will give to one filled by his Holy Spirit for the sake of work. He will give you the ability. He will give you the intelligence. He will give you the knowledge. He will give you the craftsmanship. He will allow you to devise, to create. He, will, he has given all. Say the word all. all. That all includes you. 
ability to make all that the Lord has prescribed. This is your calling. And God has called you by name. He has picked you out specifically and he has put you in a place for a reason today. Let me give you an example of some folks who have been called by name in their work. William. William has been called by name to work at John Deere. And if you talk to William, he will express to you a deep and abiding passion for data analysis. <laughs> I don't get it. I don't want to get it. But I'm sure glad he gets it. And he has given himself fully to that work to glorify God. You can be called by name as a stay-at-home mom like Brittany Thurman. I don't know if you've ever been around her four boys. Most of the time I've ever been around four boys, it's a hurricane. Those are four of the most well-behaved, well-mannered, polite young men I have ever seen in my life. Because that mama has devoted herself to the work that God has given her. Yes. By the way, be praying for her. She's had a rough pregnancy. She's going to have a fifth one. They're hoping for a girl. So... You might be called by name like a business owner, like Teresa Dominguez. Serving faithfully in other people's homes, cleaning up their messes. And by the way, Teresa gets the award of Volunteer of the Year. Because at the barbecue, a baby's diaper exploded in the top of the slide. And Teresa... Did not think twice, but climbed up there and cleaned that mess up so that it could keep going. God may call you by name to be a bank manager like Jessica Kroll. He may call you by name to be working at McDonald's like Caleb Sanchez. He may call you by name to care for the old and elderly, those who can't care for themselves like Tommy Calvin. He may call you by name to work with special needs like Eliza Lee. He may call you by name to drive a fork truck like Steve Blevins. He may call you by name as a college student like Callie and Amber. He may call you by name to make the most of your retirement years like Dan Broderson. But make no mistake. God is calling you by name name. And the work that you find yourself in today is your calling today. In 1 Samuel chapter 3, it says, then the Lord called to Samuel. And Samuel said, here I am. And then he ran to Eli the prophet and said, here I am for you called me. But Eli said, I did not call you. Lie down again. So he went and lay down. And the Lord called again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But Eli said, I did not call you, my son. Go lie down again. You can tell Samuel's a kid here, right? Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. And the word of the Lord had yet, yet not had been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again the third time, and he arose and he went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place, and the Lord came and stood, calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak for your servant hears. Guys, God's calling you this morning. He's calling you on Sunday morning at 1055 a.m. Because tomorrow morning, the majority of you are going to go to your places of work. And he's calling you this morning. Is your response going to be, speak, Lord, for your servant Hears. The work 
that you have right in front of you is your calling. Now, this part of your calling may only be a preparation phase. Think about Moses. Think about King David. Both of them served as shepherds before they moved into leading God's people. Or maybe you are in that sweet spot of calling. You're in the fulfillment stage where you're able to live out the the dream of the call. Wherever you find yourself, remember that Samuel had to learn what God's voice sounded like before he was ready to be a prophet. God may have you in a time of learning for your own good right now. I've been in pastoral ministry for 21 years. Just after I graduated from high school, I got into ministry right away. During that time of serving God in ministry... I haven't only been a pastor of a church. During that time, I've been in seasons of preparation. I've been in times where I was doing things alongside of ministry to be able to do the ministry. I worked at Subway for two years. I was a shift supervisor at CVS. I worked as a family support worker for the Division of Family Services. I taught history and science to junior high kids at a Christian school. God help us all. (laughs) Anybody that teaches that age group, the Lord bless you. I have been a janitor two different times. And I did tree work for nine years. On the side, all while working in and preparing for ministry. Guys, just because what you're doing right now isn't the dream doesn't mean it's not the call. Live in the call to get to the dream. God used each one of those experiences to help better prepare me for the work of ministry. I was no less serving Jesus. I was no less called while stocking shelves at CVS as I am preaching on this stage today because I was serving Jesus in both of those capacities. So here's the question. Will you allow God to speak to you about your work today? You can have a job, which is something to get through and survive, Or you can fully engage the work that Jesus has given you to do. But let me give you a warning in case you just want to throw this to the side. Proverbs chapter 8. Proverbs chapter 18 verse 9 says, Whoever is slack in his work is a brother to him who destroys. Look at your neighbor and say, don't be a slacker. Whoever is slack in his work is a brother to him who destroys. Guys, being a slacker, it's not funny. It's not cool. It's not acceptable in God's kingdom to be a slacker. Amen? Slacking off or not giving your best is destructive. It damages who you are working for. It damages who you are working with. And it hurts you. Because you're not getting the most out of the experience. You're not getting the most out of the calling for what Jesus has you there for right now. You are smack dab right in the middle of what God has called you for. And you have an opportunity to glorify him by giving your best every single day. And if you will allow him, God is using this time to prepare you for what comes next. And if you're faithful, what comes next is better. That's a promise. So next Sunday, we're going to talk about the difference between your calling and your purpose. The Sunday after that, we're going to discuss how our dream or our vision, the thing that we're passionate about, fits inside of our calling. But today, 
I simply need you to realize that your calling is not some far off thing. It's not something that's hiding. It's not something that you have to go looking for. Your calling is not hiding in some mystical experience. Your calling is what you find yourself doing each day. Now, please hear this last thought, okay? Your work becomes calling when you do it for Jesus. Do you hear that? Your work becomes calling when you do it faithfully for Jesus. Would you bow your heads with me? You can't fully submit a work to Jesus unless you allow Jesus to do the first work that he desires to do in your life. And the first work that Jesus desires to do in you is to save you. To put his Holy Spirit inside of you so that you can become like Bezalel. Fully equipped, fully empowered by God to do the work to live out the calling that he has. If you're here today and you've never been born again spiritually, you've never asked Jesus to save you, I want to give you that opportunity right now by leading you in a prayer. If that's the desire of your heart, simply pray these words with me. Make them your own. Jesus, I believe you are who you said you are. I believe you lived a perfect life as an example. I believe you died on the cross as the sacrifice for my sin. I believe you rose from the grave victoriously. And I put my faith in that. I give you my life. I surrender each part of it to you. And I ask you, Lord, to give me the power of your Holy Spirit to find right now this calling that you have given to me and help me to devote this work to you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing a song right now as a, as a start of our response that you're not familiar with. But I'm going to ask you to really pay attention to the words. Because these words do a great job of describing what God wants to accomplish through men and women devoted to their calling in Jesus.